So thank you so much to Tom. Thank you to the Wellesley Free Library for the invitation to share with all of you this evening. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. It's wonderful to see um, some familiar and some not so familiar names in the participant list. Um, tonight's presentation comes towards the beginning of Black History Month, and this year's theme celebrates Black resistance, a thread that we'll explore this evening. I will also be offering visual descriptions for accessibility throughout the presentation. Um, I was going to begin with myself, but you can't see me. That being said, I'll just go ahead with the, the description. Um, I am a white woman in my mid-30s with short dark hair and glasses. I am wearing a National Park Ranger uniform because the Longfellow House is managed by the U.S. National Park Service. Uh, and my opening slide displays the name of the presentation, which is taken in part from a Phyllis Wheatley poem, Freedom's Cause, Historical Black Communities and George Washington's Cambridge Camp. The slide also shows a yellow 50th anniversary uh, logo for the Longfellow House. So to dive right in, this is an area of active research. And we have many incredible partners, historians, community members, descendants who are um, researching this and we owe quite a bit too. And I'll, I'll make some recommendations as we go about other sources to check out. Um, I am the public programs supervisor at the Longfellow House, so I am not a research historian, but rather I am a practitioner of public history, helping folks to consider the complexities of the past, and again, always learning myself. This is an image of Longfellow House Washington's headquarters as it stands today on a you know, beautiful summer day. It is a yellow 18th century Georgian mansion surrounded by green lawn, and I hope that many of you have had the chance to visit us in Cambridge and uh, please stop by during our open season, which will begin on May 26th this year. So the way that we understand and talk about history directly informs the actions that we take in our present. And tonight I'd like to embrace a call from the American Association for State and Local History to build a more productive conversation about history. Um, this is a, a statement that they've made, a call that they've made in a recent report. And this includes the practice of moving away from focusing on an idea of history as abstract truth to one of ongoing critical engagement. And historic places can be part of helping us to do this. So as a little aside, like if you asked 10 people, right, to describe their experience in your local community during the historic pandemic that we've been living through, you get a complex picture of 10 different intersecting realities rather than one you know, quote, true narrative of COVID, we would have the opportunity to critically engage with where these 10 different experiences overlap, where they conflict, and where they shed light on one another in unique ways. So tonight, as we consider historical Black community in George Washington's Cambridge camp, I'd love for us to sort of hold that intention of engagement with a complicated web of individual and communal realities and also to acknowledge that there are major archival silences here, uh, that the histories of enslaved and free Black people in our country have often been suppressed in the written record. Uh, this slide shows the front staircase of the Longfellow House with ornate white woodwork and a plaster bust of George Washington looking pensive. So we'll be taking a careful look at George Washington's Cambridge camp, um, and this can help us to grapple with the paradox of liberty in our nation's founding era. Here in Cambridge, Washington took the national stage in his first long-term headquarters of the fight for American independence. Here in Cambridge, the first written instance of the phrase United States of America was penned. But this headquarters was not George Washington alone. The dozens of others who labored in and around the headquarters in Cambridge represent a complex community of enslaved people, of recently self-emancipated Black laborers, and of white laborers and aides. And so George Washington was an early advocate of independence from England. In 1769, he decried the, quote, deprivation of American freedom. Yet George Washington was a lifelong enslaver, first inheriting 10 human beings at the age of 11. When George married the widow Martha Custis, he came into possession of a large amount of land and a large number of human beings. When he arrived at Cambridge headquarters here on Brattle Street in 1775, he was 43 years old and he enslaved um, in Virginia 130 people. To Washington's view, as an enslaver, this didn't necessarily represent a paradox. 
freedom to him was for white Americans. On this slide are two silhouettes facing each other. One depicts an enslaved woman in the late 18th century wearing a long skirt and holding an infant in front of her. The other depicts an enslaved man shouldering a garden hoe. These images are taken from a series of silhouettes commissioned recently by Mount Vernon based on historical descriptions. No images of the individuals enslaved here um, are believed to exist. For the Black members of the sort of ad hoc Washington's headquarters community, the founding era's calls for freedom were exclusionary, but would also represent a powerful rhetorical tool in the long struggle, struggle for equity and inclusion under the umbrella of American liberty. I'd like to focus in on Cuba, Dinah, Malcolm, William, and three children, James, and two, quote, small boys, whose names are currently unknown. These are seven people known to have been enslaved at 105 Brattle Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as of 1774, the property that today is Longfellow House Washington's headquarters, um, shortly before George Washington's arrival on site. And here we owe a tremendous amount to our descendant community, uh, to our partners at the Royal House and Slave Quarters Museum in Medford, to History Cambridge, to the Cambridge Black History Project, the Museum of African American History on Beacon Hill, the Harvard Legacy of Slavery um, Commission, and the Descendant-Led Slave Legacy History Coalition um, for collaboratively helping to build this understanding, um, and to many of those partners for really leading the way. So significant ongoing research um, into the lives of these people and uh, their extended communities, uh, is there's significant ongoing research, including um, a National Park Service funded study that just kicked off with an incredible research team earlier this week. So this house was first built in 1759 by their enslaver, John Vassal Jr., who was heavily invested in Caribbean slavery. He had built this grand Georgian style mansion along the road to Watertown, which today we'll refer to as Brattle Street. The Vassal's financial reliance on slavery was part of a, a regional landscape here in New England, and um, Jared Hardesty, a historian, argues that slavery built New England's economy and also shaped its cultural traditions. In Cambridge, a uh, provincial census in 1754 counted 56 enslaved people. And these were people who formed community and family, um, often with other enslaved people, and enslaved people in colonial New England were sometimes able to carve out a certain degree of, of freedom of movement. This slide shows an iron fireplace backing found in the Longfellow House showing the heraldic sun symbol associated with the enslaver vassals in and uh, the year 1759 when the house was built. Um, it will slowly fade out. So by the fall of 1774, and we're just going to do a little bit of timelining here before we really dig in, um, by the fall of 1774, large crowds of angry patriots were regularly seen on Brattle Street, a neighborhood full of wealthy loyalists. The neighborhood's elite white loyalist residents fled to Boston um, late in 1774, and they left behind the people who they enslaved in Cambridge. Today, little is known about Dinah, Malcolm, William, and the children, but Cuba and her husband Tony's lives are better documented. Though their legal status was in flux, um, with their enslavers gone, Tony and Cuba, who eventually used the surname Vassal, reunited their family, including their six children, in freedom on a portion of the former John Vassal estate. So I'll timeline this out real quickly. December 1774, enslaver vassals and their neighbors flee. Um, at this point, Cuba and Tony Vassal are able to seize freedom. Uh, they continue living in a, a separate building on a portion of the former John Vassal estate. Um, by early 1775, armed conflict, uh, the earliest battles of the American Revolution break out. Patriot militias have mobilized. By May of 1775, military companies, uh, three military companies are take, have taken up residence in the former John Vassal Mansion. And in July, the former John Vassal Mansion um, becomes the established headquarters of General George Washington, while Tony and Cuba Vassal and their children remain on the property 
in an adjacent farmhouse farming for their own livelihood. So as historian Gloria Whiting describes it, in a span of months, and I'll quote from her here because she really pins it down, Tony and Kuba Vassal found themselves living in a militarized town in a rebel colony, sharing an estate with the Patriot Army's commander in chief. This shot slide shows that Patriot Army's commander in chief. Um, this is a painting of a young-ish George Washington in military attire uh, by Charles Wilson Peale. And it, it sits next to on the slide, the handwritten signature of Darby Vassal. So from 1774 to 1781, Cuba, Tony, and their family remained in another dwelling on the estate. And um, this is perhaps a farmhouse noted on uh, what is today the neighboring campus of Lesley University. That farmhouse, unfortunately, is no longer extant. Um, but Tony and Cuba Vassal were tending about three quarters of an acre of this land for their own livelihood. And records from the period also document payments to Tony Vassal for work on um, other local confiscated royalist estates. So I'll back out for a second here. In our interpretation and research, um, we seek to center the humanity of those we know um, who were enslaved and who seized freedom here, while simultaneously talking honestly about the violent and racist reality of slavery. Um, and in this practice, we, we owe a lot to the work of um, a historian and a public historian named Elon Cook Lee, um, who's done some really incredible talks um, and, and work. So who were they as human beings? George Washington here left plenty of written evidence that continues to shape his memory. But how might the people who were largely prevented from recording their own histories, like the family of Tony and Cuba Vassal, want to be remembered? One place to start is the story of an encounter reported to have taken place in the summer of 1775 involving an act of resistance and freedom by a formerly enslaved six-year-old named Darby Vassal, Tony and Cuba's Vassal's son. Um, and Darby Vassal, at the point when this story takes place, the summer of 1775, Darby Vassal had recently been reunited with his parents following a separation at the hands of their now gone enslavers. Um, this story, which was first recorded after Darby Vassal's death, described a six-year-old child, Darby Vassal, outside at headquarters when General George Washington walked up to him and told him to go inside the house and get to work. And Darby Vassal, in turn, refused to work for no pay. While the veracity of this historical encounter is unclear, the narrative power of a formerly enslaved child standing up to the general is unmistakable. In the account, uh, Darby Vassal later described George Washington as, quote, no gentleman. He wanted a boy to work without wages. This slide shows a Courier and Ives print of George Washington taking command of the army on the Cambridge Common. Washington is on a horse under a tree flanked by officers and faced by hundreds of orderly white soldiers shouldering bayonets. So as headquarters was established on the estate where they were living, it's unclear whether or not any other members of Tony and Cuba Vassal's family uh, personally encountered George. But how did George get there in the first place? Um, the month prior, in June 1775, he had been appointed the con commander in chief of the Continental Army by the Continental Congress. Um, that same month, the Battle of Bunker Hill took place in Boston. Shortly after that, on July 2nd, 1775, and this is a full year before the Declaration of Independence is issued, um, a 43-year-old Washington arrives in Cambridge, formally assumes command, as you see here, um, and then a couple weeks later moves into his long-term headquarters at 105 Brattle Street, the former John Vassal House, today the Longfellow House. Uh, the Provincial Provincial Congress, so the Massachusetts Congress Committee of Safety, uh, were managing military affairs here in Massachusetts, and they started prepping the former Vassal House for George early in July 1775, and they retained a steward named Timothy Austin to sort of manage the whole household. And Timothy Austin's account books reveal a lot. And um, Tom put a couple of links, I believe, in the chat at the beginning. One of them is to uh, an in-depth article on our website that details 
um, the wives and a number of sources attached to Tony and Kuba Vassell's family. The other is a 700 page report by the incredible historian John Bell, um, where he really dug into these account books um, and many, many other things. So that, that's the go-to source for Washington's headquarters. Um, both of those are, are available to you right now online. So um, Timothy Austin, Emily, yes. I, yeah. I just wanted to interrupt for a second. You got a Please. question that says, what's the half moon thing around Washington's neck in the Peel painting? Oh, great question. I don't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's a, an excellent question. I'd have to do a little bit more digging. Um, all right. So um, if you look at, at and, and like John Bell did, the historian whose report is linked there, if you look into... Uh, Timothy Austin, the stewards account books, they reveal just individually listed out the food, the furnishings, the supplies, everything that he was in charge of procuring for Washington's headquarters for the nine months that it was set up in Cambridge. The only thing that, that George directed himself the purchasing of was wine and spirits. Um, he ordered an incredible amount of Madeira wine, uh, which represented some of his highest expenditures. Um, there was food, there was fine tableware, they were hosting a lot of fine dinners on the dime of the Continental Army here. So the next slide shows a, a 19th century painting titled Lady Washington's Arrival. This um, is an imagined uh, rendering of Martha Washington arriving at Cambridge headquarters in the winter of 1775. Um, it depicts the vassal house in its original gray paint with about two dozen people on foot and on horseback in front. So uh, John Bell identified several uh, women paid for regular work in the George Washington's headquarters here in Cambridge. These people include Timothy Austin's wife and daughter, um, but many others as well. And some of these women may have lived on and others off the property during the time of the headquarters. One of the most intriguing uh, is a woman named, uh, just named as Dinah in Austin's records. Dinah was paid eight months wages as Washington left Cambridge, meaning that she'd probably started work, according to John Bell, around the beginning of August. Um, since Dinah's first name uh, was the only name that Austin recorded, this strongly suggests, based on how these things were recorded, that she was of African descent. Um, and though there's currently no direct evidence that we're aware of to confirm this, it's an interesting possibility that this Dinah may be the same Dinah formerly enslaved by John Bassel, now a free laborer in the same house and paid by the Continental Army. There are three other women uh, who likely worked alongside Dinah. They were likely white on account of their full names being recorded by Austin. These were Mrs. Morrison, the kitchen woman, Elizabeth Chapman, and a laundress named Mary Kettle. There, Austin also recorded an unnamed woman or women who he paid for cleaning the house. He recorded paying Margaret Thomas, a free black woman, um, for sewing three shirts for William Lee, a man who was enslaved by George Washington in the winter of 1776. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about her later. Austin's accounts also mention a man named Peter, um, who was most likely also of African descent and worked in the stables. These documents also mention a coachman uh, with no name attached, but it's possible that this could have been Tony Vassell who had been a coachman while enslaved and who continued to work with horses in his period of freedom. Um, neither Austin's notebooks nor Washington's notebooks mention, make any mention of Tony and Kuba Vassell and their children, but according to later testimony, it's clear that they were present. They may have been farming for themselves in parts of the then 100-acre vassal estates be beyond Washington's headquarters building, or that they were forced to serve Washington, or that they appear anonymously, say, as the coachman. Oops, I skipped ahead there. Um, just briefly, Washington was also surrounded by a number of his generals, a secretary, and three aides to camp at any given time, and just a rotating list of visiting dignitaries. Uh, ultimately, he would spend nine months in Cambridge. He, while here, was charged with turning the very sort of informally trained and localized New England militias into a unified fighting force that could match and drive the British army out of Boston. Um, as an enslaver, Washington was really shocked to find a racially integrated army in Massachusetts, 
and in one of his first major decisions here, removed black soldiers from the military. Some generals disagreed with him and many of the soldiers themselves advocated for their right to fight. But when contracts for the Continental Army soldiers expired at the end of 1775, Washington faced an enlistment crisis and quite a bit of low morale. Uh, at this point, he made a calculated decision to reintegrate the Continental Army to allow black soldiers back to fight for the cause. And as a result, the army fighting for American liberty from England is becomes the most racially integrated the US Army was um, until the Korean War in the mid 20th century. And this was free black men, many of them recently enslaved fighting, uh, including folks like the famed soldier and later activist Prince Hall, whose family would become close with Tony and Kuba vassals. This slide shows a John Trumbull painting um, painted around 1780, so just a few years after Washington's Cambridge headquarters. And it shows um, a middle-aged George Washington and William Lee. It depicts William Lee in stylized dress with a red head covering. This is the only known image of Lee and the side will slide will transition to a cropped close-up of Lee. So I'd like to shift the focus to William Lee now um, and also to, to reckon a little bit with George Washington's identity as an enslaver. By the time of Washington's death, ultimately in 1799, uh, he and Martha enslaved over 300 people at Mount Vernon. And over the course of his lifetime, at least 47 people tried to self-emancipate from George. George purchased William Lee and William Lee's brother Frank in 1768 and brought them to Mount Vernon. William Lee was just 18 years old and his Frank 15. For two decades, William Lee was made to accompany Washington nearly everywhere, including Cambridge headquarters. He was about 25 years old when he arrived in Cambridge. He's been described as Washington's valet or manservant, and Lee had to do everything from delivering messages to organizing papers, holding Washington's spyglass, laying out his clothes, helping him dress. Uh, Lee suffered some very serious knee injuries in the 1780s and was the only person to be directly freed upon Washington's death and provided a $30 pension. In traditional histories, um, particularly by white historians, much has been made about their ostensible closeness, um, but this was a relationship of enslavement um, with coercion at its core. Interestingly, during the revolution, Lee married a free black woman named Margaret Thomas. They likely met in Cambridge when Thomas was hired to sew Lee's shirts. She then continued traveling with George Washington's camp as the war progressed and Lee asked George Washington to bring her to Mount Vernon. Um, George was not in favor of this idea, but sort of grudgingly agreed. However, um, Margaret Thomas's archival trail sort of goes cold here as far as we know so far. Um, and she likely died before ever arriving at Mount Vernon. So this is really complicated. And the history, which is revealed only through the, the thinnest of records here, represents a deeply complex series of relationships. Enslaved families were often forced to live apart and it was not completely unheard of for black families in New England to even contain some free and some enslaved members. I wonder what it was like for William Lee to interact with free Black community members like Thomas, um, potentially like Tony and Kuba Vassal. They were here beginning to carve out their own freedom. How might forming a family with a free Northern Black woman affect Lee, enslaved by one of the nation's most powerful men? Thomas herself would have been deeply aware of the risks she took by forming this family and by agreeing to go to Mount Vernon. And why did George Washington acquiesce to her presence? These are questions that I don't have conclusive historical or emotional answers to. Um, and I'd like to examine one more complex exchange before we conclude that may raise um, more questions than answers as well. This slide shows an engraving of Phyllis Wheatley, a young black woman seated with quill and paper in an 18th century dress. This uh, engraving appears in her 1773 book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. So in October 1775, likely shortly before Lee and Thomas met, the newly emancipated 22-year-old published Black poet Phyllis Wheatley wrote 
a letter to George Washington at Cambridge headquarters. She wrote uh, in part, Sir, I have taken the freedom to address your excellency in the enclosed poem. You being appointed by the Grand Continental Congress to be generalissimo of the armies of North America, together with the fame of your virtues, excite sensations not easy to suppress. The poem concluded with the following words that are on the screen now. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine with gold unfading, Washington be thine. Uh, prior to this poem, Wheatley had written um, a, a book of poetry. She wrote on religious and moral subjects. She also wrote about her abhorrence of slavery and experience of being kidnapped from her family in West Africa at the age of seven. When George Washington eventually replied to Phyllis Wheatley, um, again, John Bell in this great report that uh, we've linked for you, noted that he had no practice in addressing a learned black woman. Even the salutation in George Washington's letter was a challenge. Normally, George Washington might refer to a black woman by her first name only, uh, but he knew to address an unmarried lady as Miss last name. So in February, Washington wrote back and he sought a middle ground addressing her as Miss Phyllis. He wrote, I thank you most sincerely for your polite notice of me in the elegant lines you enclosed and however undeserving I may, the style and grammar, uh, style and manner exhibit a striking proof of your great poetical talents. I would have published the poem had I not be, been apprehensive that while I only meant to give the world this new instance of your genius, I might have incurred the imputation of vanity. If you should ever come to Cambridge or near headquarters, I shall be happy to see a person so favored by the muses and to whom nature has been so liberal and beneficent in her dispensations. I am with great respect, your obedient humble servant, G. Washington. So this poem was very flattering um, and George Washington really liked it. He had a lot of feigned modesty here. He later heavily hinted to an aide that it really should be published to the public. Um, and so his aide published it. The humble servant sign-off was, was really common in 18th century correspondence, but nevertheless, it is striking to see Washington who enslaved hundreds and harbored deeply racist views, use it when addressing the recently enslaved Wheatley. There is no proof despite rumors, um, unfortunately, that Wheatley ever visited headquarters. So by the time that he wrote to Phyllis Wheatley, um, his time in Cambridge was coming to a close and this slide shows George Washington in military dress next to a white war horse. In March of 1776, the fort fortification of Dorchester Heights and the resulting evacuation of British troops from Boston occurred uh, under his direction. And by April, George, the people he enslaved, his paid staff, they were all on their way to their next revolutionary headquarters. Many of the local workers remained in Cambridge and the siege of Boston was broken, but the era of the revolution was just getting underway. And whatever community had formed was dispersed, but perhaps endured in ways that are not yet completely clear. So I'm gonna finish us out here with a little bit of an update. This slide shows an 18th century written document with two pages of text signed uh, with a bold T mark in the um, in the bottom left corner here, and I'm highlighting it a little bit. This is Anthony Vassell, Tony Vassell's T, um, and we often refer to him as Tony Vassell because he consistently signs his mark as a T. So Anthony or Tony and Cuba Vassell spent the next six years after Washington departs continuing to farm in freedom, however tenuous that was on the former John Vassell estate. Their enslaver went to England and never came back. Around 1778, the uh, Middlesex County probate of John Vassell's former estate revealed a really remarkable move by Tony Vassell to secure financial stability for his family. Thomas Farrington, who was a local official overseeing the confiscated Vassal estate, noted that he paid Anthony Vassal the large, like remarkably large sum of 222 pounds for, quote, supporting a Negro woman and two children for three years. And that was his family. 
Tony and Kuba Vassal then continued to advocate for financial compensation, really I'd argue reparations, out of their former enslavers' estate. In 1780, uh, the state legislature, the, the legislature of the Commonwealth, um, had authorized the seizure and sale of abandoned loyalist properties, including the John Vassal estate. Um, Tony and Kuba Vassal then faced eviction. And so with the help of a literate and experienced friend, perhaps someone like Prince Hall, um, they petitioned the legislature to be allowed, uh, or really granted the deed to their small portion of the estate and to continue cultivating the land. Um, that petition was either denied or never heard, but a couple months later in early 1781, they filed this petition that you see on the screen with a T mark. Um, and let me just put a little excerpt of it up on the screen. This is very strategic language here. Though dwelling in a land of freedom, both himself, Tony, and his wife, Cuba, have spent almost 60 years of their lives in slavery, and that though deprived of what now makes them happy beyond expression, yet they have ever lived a life of honesty and been faithful in their master's service. One hopes that they shall not be denied the sweets of freedom the remainder of their days by being reduced to the painful necessity of begging for bread. This petition, um, like many others, invoked really specific and strategic language directed at the audience of white legislators. Um, it invokes both uh, revolutionary period freedom rhetoric, right, dwelling in the land of freedom, um, but also sort of presents this as reparations that don't significantly shift the social order. Um, I would argue that the intent and ultimately impact of this was quite a bit more radical than the strategic language lets on. Um, Tony Vassal uh, was then granted a 12 pound annual pension out of the sale of the John Vassal estate. So this petition was successful uh, and the family was later evicted. So despite the success of their petition, the Vassals and other free black Cantabrigians carved out freedom in an environment of ongoing racial discrimination and continuing legal uncertainty, it wasn't until about 1783 um, that a series of court cases signaled the legal end of slavery in Massachusetts. A couple of years later, Tony and Cuba Vassal purchased a home nearby in Cambridge and later purchased five additional acres. They ultimately lived into the early 19th century. Shown here is a handwritten early 19th century petition with six names signed, including Primus Hall and Darby Vassal. And several of the children of Tony and Kuba Vassal went on to become noted activists in the Cambridge and Boston Black communities. Their son Darby, who stood up to uh, George Washington as a six-year-old, Darby Vassal lived to be 92. He died several months after the start of the American Civil War. Darby Vassal was a lifelong abolitionist and activist for Black education. He was apparently literate. Here you see his name signed um, to a petition for school funding in 1812, and his signature is all the way down at the bottom. Um, he was referred to later in life by fellow abolitionists as a, quote, venerable relic of the revolutionary period, so someone remembered for a sense of history as well. Shown here on our final slide is um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the 19th century poet's study in a modern photo. Longfellow uh, took up residence in the house several decades after Washington, and the house is still furnished with his stuff today. It's a, a view of a study with a round center table cluttered with books, uh, a desk in front of a window, brown wallpaper, deep red curtains and carpet, and an ornate black armchair in the foreground. In 1855, at the age of 86, Darby Vassal returned to the house on Brattle Street to visit with the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And this is an encounter recorded in Longfellow's journal. And although Henry gives us no indication of what they discussed, he does tell us that it was a lengthy conversation. It took place here in the study, the room that was used 80 years earlier as George Washington's dining room and council chamber, a room that sat on the site of slavery and emancipation for Darby Vassal's family, and where Darby Vassal, 86 years old, now claimed his space. I would suggest that history helps us make progress towards a more just future. Historic sites offer a special opportunity to grapple with our country's historic injustices. And while the names on our sign are Washington and Longfellow, two uh, wealthy white guys, Making progress towards a more just society requires understanding also the people whose stories were previously excluded. And this includes the people who were enslaved here and who fought for freedom for generations to come. 
including Kuba Vassal and her family, Dinah, William Lee and Margaret Thomas, the two small boys. I wanna recognize their living descendants, particularly of Darby Vassal, who today are passionate stewards of their ancestors' legacy and wonderful collaborators. So to bring us up to the present, I wanna leave you with a quote from Darby Vassal, um, given during a toast that he made at a public event in 1825. And in this toast, Darby Vassal looked forward to, quote, the time when the color of a man shall no longer be a pretext for depriving him of his liberty. And we will conclude the presentation here. And I would be very happy to hear your questions. Thank you very much, Emily. I just... I just think I figured out why your video wasn't working. Sorry, I didn't figure it out during, but thanks for the talk. And there are six people who chimed in with the answer. To oh, the incredible. Question. I'm looking at it right now. This is great. I'm going to save these and, and study up. This is the beauty of a, you know, when the, the synergies of, a, of an event, we'll all learn something. So, <clears throat> Oh, very interesting, Beth. So you can see the last uh, question, two obits connecting black men of Salem to service with George Washington. So we're kind of opening it up right now. Oh, well, somebody else is. Yeah, yeah I see a question from Rose. Um, so Rose Doherty asks, why were Tony and Cuba um, evicted? This is a great question. So they were ultimately evicted from the former Vassal estate in 1781 because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, was auctioning all of these abandoned uh, Tory loyalist estates. So after the revolution, the Commonwealth, essentially eminent domain, they seize all of these properties, they start to sell them. Um, and so in 1781, that's the year that this the Vassal mansion all of the outbuildings and all of the hundred acres of land were sold to a new owner. Um, at that point, Tony and Cuba and their family were evicted from the land um, with the pension they and the, and the earlier payment out of the Vassal estate that they had advocated for. They were ultimately able to buy five acres and a, a home near the Cambridge Common. Uh, there are about five years intervening where we're not exactly sure where they were living. And, um, our archivist actually recently identified a land record that shows at least Tony Vassal appearing for a brief time in the Boston household of a short-term owner of the Vassal estate. So there's a lot of really complicated movement um, going on here, but essentially this property was sold. Um, and because their first petition to be able to stay on the land and actually own a piece of the land was denied, um, they, they were evicted. Thank you for asking. Um, so several questions here from an anonymous attendee. How do we understand how Washington would have looked at enslaved people? Did he view them as, quote, humans? And if not, do we know what words he might have used to explain his views? Um, I will say, so there's a, there's a lot of really, really good work that's been done on this and, and Mount Vernon um, as in its current form as a mu museum and research center um, have worked with a lot of historians and interpreters to do some really thoughtful work on the lives of enslaved people um, and also sort of grappling with Washington's views and identity as an enslaver. Um, I, I hesitate to, to comment in great detail on Washington's views because I'm not as familiar with his, with his writings on the subject. Um, he, I'll, I will say on this is that again, he was a lifelong enslaver. He was served by enslaved people from birth. He became a, an enslaver uh, at the age of 11 and the number of people who he enslaved grew over his lifetime. He, um, he did not hesitate um, to sell people away from their families as a punishment. Um, and sort of all of these tactics that are utilized um, by enslavers to both really dehumanize the people who they enslave um, and to sort of prey upon and manipulate some of 
the most human aspects of us, right? So family, community. Um, there's, again, I, there's been a lot of really thoughtful writing on his views. And so I'll see if we can pop some more sources in there. Um, I feel a little bit better qualified to comment on the next two. So how do we know, uh, do we know how he would have explained not paying an enslaved child? Um, so this, in, I assume that you're referring to the encounter with six-year-old Darby Vassal. Darby Vassal, at the age of six, was free. Um, he had actually been separated from his parents as an infant by their enslaver given to another enslaver in South Luburn. Um, that man died at the Battle of Bunker Hill, likely leaving a six-year-old Darby Vassal to somehow return to his parents. And this is where I think about the level of community and connection and networking that Kuba and Tony Vassal had um, to, to be able to get their son back. So when Darby Vassal encountered George Washington, he was a very free, recently freed child. Um, and his, his family is in, in a similar situation. So according to this anecdote, again, which is, you know, has, has wonderful elements of storytelling, uh, Darby Vassal says that he asked George Washington, how much are you going to pay me? Washington was very taken aback at the idea of paying a Black child anything, um, refused to pay him, and so Darby Vassal refused to work. Um, that's all that the anecdote tells us, but again, Washington was not accustomed in his life to paying Black people for their labor. Um, a horrible question in today's dollars, how much would have Washington paid for a human? Um, this is well documented um, in his records as well. For example, I believe he paid about 68 pounds for William Lee, an 18-year-old, um, and this varies widely. Again, it's a horrible, horrible thing to contemplate, um, the valuation of, of people, um, but that is well documented at Mount Vernon. Um, is John Bell the best contact or other suggestions? I keep shouting out John Bell. Um, some people may be familiar with his work. Uh, he's a great friend to Longfellow House Washington's headquarters National Historic Site. He is the proprietor of Boston1775.net, a daily blog of, um, of uh, revolutionary era history and gossip. And he penned this 700 page research study. So he's a great resource on Washington's time in Cambridge in particular. Um, why was Washington of Virginia chosen to be put in charge of the Continental Army, uh, which at that point was primarily operating in Massachusetts? Was anyone else considered? This is a great question. Yes. Um, so Francis, thank you for asking. Um, um, there's some there's some wheeling and dealing going on in the Continental Congress here. And one of the things that makes Washington, who's not the most experienced military commander, one of the things that makes him appealing um, as a choice for the Continental Congress is that he is he is a Southern figure. He's seen as somebody who can kind of get the Southern colonies to come along. Um, so there are other people who are considered. There are several other generals who are here with him at headquarters who are equally, if not more, qualified. But as New Englanders, Northerners, um, they don't have this sort of unifying influence that the Continental Congress is hoping for. Um, there's a great moment where Washington shows up at the Continental Congress in his military uniform, right? He fought in the French and Indian War. Um, he's, he dresses for the job he wants, and he gets it. Um, and, you know, when Washington arrives in Massachusetts, he's, he's pretty taken aback at the, um, at the, the state of the army. And we talked about him segregating the army or expelling Black soldiers. Um, he also comments on he's he's really he's used to a, a, a British style army right he's served in the British army um what he sees is a very sort of decentralized less hierarchical group of localized militias um he refers to them at one point as quote exceedingly dirty and nasty uh he wants to see camps organized differently he wants to see latrines dug away from drinking sources so he's got some like military organizational ideas that he wants to bring to New England, um, but largely his selection is, is a political one. Um, Wayne has a great comment here, and I think it is, oh, it's more about the, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is it a gorget? Is it a gorget? Um, so check out Wayne's comment for sure. 
Um, John asks, what was the status of the children of an enslaved man and a free African-American woman? Um, that is a great question. Um, in many of the colonies, um, legally children follow the status of their mother. Um, this may have been one of the pieces that sort of put Washington out about the idea of Margaret Thomas joining William Lee at Mount Vernon. Um, the presence of a free black woman in family with people who he enslaved was not something that there was much precedent for um, at Mount Vernon. And it, it may have been that Washington might not have been able to enslave her children. Um, again, unfortunately, it appears that she passed away before she made it to Mount Vernon um, and was not married to William Lee for, for therefore that many years. Um, relatedly, but on a different family and a different sort of geography, there's a really interesting moment that we're not sure quite what to imagine with yet, where um, Tony and Cuba Vassal, still enslaved, one of their children becomes free. Um, around 1769, Tony and Cuba's daughter Flora, who's then a toddler, in an incredibly painful moment, was separated from her mother and father um, by their then enslavers. and. Um, sold to a family in Billerica, so about 20 miles north. And recently, um, our colleagues at Harvard unearthed a document um, showing Tony Vassell in 1772 traveling to Billerica and furnishing 20 pounds to purchase the manumission, the freedom of his then five-year-old daughter. And this document indicates, uh, very clearly indicates who her parents are, who her parents are enslaved by, and it very clearly indicates that she's going to be free and nobody and nobody's heirs are going to have claim over her, but that she's being released as a five-year-old to the care of her still enslaved mother on the John Vassell property. Um, so this is, I'm sorry, this is really sort of me associating a little bit, um, but this shows, especially around the time of the revolution, some of the real complexities um, of family status and separation at the hands of enslavers um, and some of the ramifications of certain family members being free and some being being enslaved. Um, but we know that Flora then um, grows up. She remains very close with her siblings. They, uh, three of them all live on the same plot of land and build houses together. Um, she has her own children. Um, so this is a family that once they reunite, they stay very, very close. Um, someone looked up uh, some equivalencies um, for, for money in, in 1775 and today. Thank you. Are there questions or, or comments? Um, anything that's sort of sparking for folks? Or any questions that I missed? Mm I, I'll again just re-emphasize what an active area of research this is. Um, so there's been quite a, a sort of groundswell of interest over the past several years in um, the and awareness of Tony and Kuba Vassal, Darby Vassal. Darby Vassal um, really becomes a community leader and a prominent figure in many ways. So he sort of crops up in association with a lot of different people, a lot of different abolitionists, a lot of different historic sites in the greater Boston area. Um, and there, there's a, a great recent online exhibit from the Museum of African American History uh, called We Reclaim Space um, that has to do with Darby Vassal um, and his life. There's an incredible project that was done in conjunction with Christchurch, uh, Harvard, and some of Darby Vassal's descendants called Here Lies Darby Vassal, which sort of thinks about memorialization and his final resting place, which is at Christchurch in Cambridge. Um, complicatedly in the tomb of Henry Vassal, um, a different white enslaver Vassal who once enslaved his parents. And um, Darby Vassal later in life was sort of given permission to be buried there um, and for his own reasons chose to do so. Um, this makes him the only member of his family whose grave we can identify. Um, we know where he is. 
his descendants know where he is. Um, so there's there's a just a, a proliferation of really exciting research going on. Um, a lot of this again builds on. If I have one recommendation, it is to check out the work of the, the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford. This is an incredible Black-led institution. It's the only identified freestanding slave quarters in New England, um, and they've over the past decade or more just totally reoriented their research and interpretation to um, do some of the best work on New England slavery um, in the in the House Museum world. So please check out the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford. Um, that's actually a site where Cuba Vassal as a child was enslaved. So there are a lot of like direct community connections as well. Um, and as I said earlier this week, we just kicked off uh, a scholarly study that'll take the next three years looking into some of this history. Um, some folks may have seen the headline in the Globe yesterday about an incredible report done by Harvard doctoral fellow um, Abed Alibai, um, who's also working with the Royal House. He did a great presentation at uh, First Church in Roxbury about people enslaved by members of that congregation historically. Um, and then this morning I came in and our archivist had pulled a 10 page uh, deposition that Darby Vassal gave in 1835 just in some sort of like unrelated property dispute amongst the heirs of somebody whose property abutted his. So it didn't seem that juicy, but all of a sudden here's 10 pages of Darby Vassal in his own words on our screens that we know some of our colleagues had seen before, but that was a that was a new thing for us and allowed us to spark some new connections. So um, just stay, all of this is to say, I'm a little too excited about it. Um, and please stay with us as, as these stories continue to emerge and as they continue to connect to places like Wellesley, um, places like Salem, uh, places like Beacon Hill in Boston and beyond. Um, and please come visit us. We do a deep dive tour of this history every Saturday during our open season. Um, we'll be offering some poetry workshops coming up as well um, that engage um, with uh, the Phyllis Wheatley history. Um, so, so a lot of a lot of thought and a lot of research um, and a lot of collaboration going into this. And um, above all, it's the the work of Darby Vassal and Tony and Kuba Vassal's living descendants um, that have really continued to propel this forward. So we, we owe a great deal to them. I'll hang out for any more questions and I promise I won't go on as long. <laughs> You know, I'm jumping in here just to uh, tell everybody we've got a few minutes left. If you wanna, if you have any other questions, you know, thank you, Emily. Yeah. This was so such a wonderful program. Thank you, I somebody says I'm amazed at the long lives of enslaved people, and it it varies so much. Um, Tony Vassal lived to the reported age of 98, which was pretty extraordinary. Darby Vassal to the age of 92. He um, very sadly outlived all but one of his eight children. Um, his daughter, Frances, is um, actually married another prominent abolitionist and, and is the line of descendants there. Um, he outlived most of, or all of his siblings as well. Um, but then he had these lifelong friendships too with people like Primus Hall and Prince Hall with his parents. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of variation in lifespans, but there are some long lived genes um, among Tony and Darby Vassal. Kuba lived to be about 78 or 80, I think. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Emily, especially to you. I mean, you know, this was such an enjoyable program. Thanks, everybody, for joining us from many libraries across eastern Massachusetts. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it, I'll, uh, we'll be making the recording available if people want a, a copy of the recording. And I think that's pretty much it. This has been one of the most fun programs I've, I've attended. And I appreciate it, Emily. If there are any post questions, people can submit them in and we'll get them to Emily so she can address them. And I'm just noticing we jumped up in some questions. I just, before right. we jump out, we got two I minutes. I answer them as briefly as possible. So yeah, two minutes here. Here, here you go. You got. Okay. Lightning round. Longfellow House. Longfellow House will be open for public programs from uh, May 25th through October 30th this coming year. Although you can always go on our website and make a reservation in the off season. Um, 
we will be doing our regular fall lecture series. We will be doing our summer festival with poetry and music outside on the lawn. We'll be doing some special poetry workshops, a Juneteenth event. So um, please come to our website and, and check out what we've got going on. Um, in continuing research, what are some types of sources that they're, they're looking for and hoping to find? This is an incredible question. Um, there are a lot of things that are tucked into archives that nobody knows they're there, right? Um, so they're going to turn up some interesting stuff. They're going to turn up stuff in newspapers that haven't been cataloged before. Um, they're also traveling. They're planning to travel to Antigua and Jamaica to look at, at, at Caribbean records as well. So we're hoping and feeling like after our first meeting, they're going to turn up an incredible amount. So please stay tuned. We'll be releasing information on this. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, yeah, just thank you. Thank you so much to the Wellesley Library. Thank you to the whole consortium of libraries and to all of you. I am the world's biggest library fan. And, uh, you know, if us museum people weren't museums, we'd all want to be in libraries. So thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thank you so much again, Emily. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out this evening. We're all better for it. Thanks a bunch. And until the next one, everybody. Keep visiting your local libraries. Take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>